globe of the 40 or 45 million centuries of the Earth's history, this one is very special. This is the first century when human beings, one species, have the future of the planet in their hands. So the stakes are very high. There is a new category of risks which are certainly going to be global and would involve some sort of catastrophic setback to civilization. Accenture risk is a risk or a threat that might wipe out um, humanity at some point in the future. Or at least wiping out the, the, the kind of high-tech, civilised lifestyle that we've got used to over the past few centuries. So in, in effect, setting us back to the Dark Ages. The suffering that would be caused to, to billions of humans in the process of one of those threats evolving. So even if it didn't get to the stage of wiping out humanity, uh, that huge amount of suffering is a, a big interest. Now, new technologies, bio, cyber and AI, are empowering us and they have huge potential for good, but also by error or by terror, they could cause serious catastrophes. So potentially catastrophic that once is too often. So these are the kind of things which are on the agenda of our center. What we are trying to do as a research group is effectively to build bridges, open lines of communication and collaboration between the leading um, researchers, whether they be in academia or in industry, the academics who are thinking about the economic, social, philosophical, ethical implications, the risk, and the policymakers who very much need to have a deep understanding of these things. The world's never been as connected as it is now. We are so interconnected that anything really serious in one part of the world will cascade globally. Computer networks can cascade a cyber attack globally. Pandemics can spread at the speed of a jet aircraft. Panic and rumour can spread literally at the speed of light through social media. It's amazing how little effort is devoted to these major issues. I must admit that I do have sleepless nights over these issues. I. I think there are a number of threats that are quite salient. Uh, I believe that the threat of nuclear war has never really gone away. The world population is much higher than it was. 50 years ago it was about 3 billion, it's now 7.4 billion, and almost certain to rise to 9 billion by mid-century. So we are having a much heavier footprint on the planet with the risk of tipping points. We are wiping out species at a faster rate than we ever have before, and we simply don't know what the effects on our own uh, well-being and survival will be from that. Climate change is a very real threat. One of the big questions scientifically is, how bad could it be? How will we be able to respond to it, and will we be able to take the steps in time? Advances in biotechnology will help us cure many diseases and increase quality of life for people. But there is always the potential that could lead to accidental releases of organisms such as modified influenza virus or the development of ever more powerful bioweapons. I mean, in terms of getting to the existential level of risk, I think the top one currently is if states were to have biological warfare programs. Because at the moment, terrorists can't get to a level of sophistication that states can. Even a few people could create a bioweapon that could produce global catastrophe. And this is why things are much more dangerous now than when we had just nuclear threats to worry about. The equipment that's needed is small scale and dual use, available in many university labs, and it's very hard to uh, imagine any kind of verification regime that could ensure that none of it is used for nefarious purposes or negligently. Artificial intelligence can be a bit of a tricky thing to define. A broad definition would be that artificial intelligence is any 
cognitive capability that we normally associate with being within the domain of what humans are only able to do. The very interesting thing about artificial intelligence is that it can be seen as a general purpose technology in that advances in artificial intelligence will allow us to make better progress on a range of other technologies. It's wonderful if you can talk in your phone in one language and comes out in a literate speech in a different language. Things like that are going to be feasible. It's probably clear that large networks and systems like electric power grids can be coped with better by AI than by human controllers. There are many, many aspects of healthcare that we might be able to improve with artificial intelligence. So examples to include automated ways of diagnosing tumours. But if this was the kind of thing that a smartphone could do, powered by an AI system, suddenly you can bring that sort of treatment to a much wider range of people. Right now, most of the artificial intelligence that we see in the world comes under the narrow definition in that these systems are designed to solve a particular problem within a particularly set environment, but aren't necessarily able to do anything else. So Deep Blue is able to play chess better than a grandmaster. It's not able to play a um, simpler game like checkers. It's certainly not able to make a cup of tea or to tie its shoelaces. There's a different idea, which is that of artificial general intelligence, and this refers to the idea of an intelligence that is much broader in its scope and capability. And right now, that's the domain of humans and animals. To give an example, what if you had a Mars rover that rather than just going through a set of steps, you could just send it out and say, look for something interesting, design a few scientific hypotheses, carry out those experiments, and figure out what we should know about Mars. If you were able to develop a system like that, it would be tremendously powerful and important. And right now, research in this direction is still at an early stage. We're going to be sharing the planet with a lot of stuff which is not biological and which on many dimensions is as smart as we are. But it comes with a note of caution. A lot of people within the research community are worried about potential application of artificial intelligence to various aspects of warfare, both in the design of autonomous weapons that would be able to take independent kill decisions, but also in the more kind of systemic issues of AI systems managing lots of information around a wartime situation. If we're bringing these systems into the world in various safety critical settings like self-driving cars, medical diagnostics and so on, we need to know how they're coming to the answers that they are. It's not just enough to say, well, it's better than a human 90% of the time. There is the possibility, and this is what some people worry about, that uh, a very intelligent machine, which has access to the Internet of Things, will be able to uh, do things which are unpredictable. It may find ways to sort of work around your off switch. How do you turn a broad, amorphous concept like human morality into something that can be instilled crisply into a uh, a new system. Can you come up with a moral code that is sufficiently satisfactory for all of humanity? Right now this is a deep question of debate within both the philosophical and technological community. Then of course um, there's a much deeper question which is a philosophical one of the extent to which these machines will develop consciousness. I mean some people think consciousness is uh, something which is peculiar to sort of wet hardware and human skulls. Others think it's something which emerges when you get up to a certain level of complexity. I think it probably will require a change of the definition of what it means to be human, although one might argue that the definition of what it is to be human has been changing over the course of our history. Right now, we're developing biotechnologies that allow us to correct errors in our genome and remove you know, horrible diseases that previous generations have taken for granted. I would regard that as a change of what it is to be human. Once we bring artificial intelligence in, that will perhaps change what it is to be human even more radically. At least in the case of AI, when you start to talk about extinction, there's a number of possibilities you need to consider. I mean, the, at the sort of bleakest end, our species might 
come to an end with, with, with no successor. But then there are a range of less bleak possibilities, which is that the, the purely biological species eventually comes to, to the end in that there are, there are no humans around who, who don't have access to this enabling technology that make, makes them, in some sense, something which is transhuman. This is going to be a long-term threat. Um, there are some people who, of course, think that we need to worry already about uh, AI and that the developing that area needs to be regulated in the same way as everyone agrees that biotech needs to be regulated. At, at a time in which regulation is not a political flavour of the month. But I think that's another reason for trying to develop a broad community with as much cooperation in it at this early stage to make it easier when we get to some of those tricky questions. All scientists who work on subjects with any societal impact should be concerned about that impact. And so decisions about how science is applied should not be made just by scientists, because uh, scientists shouldn't play God. They, they um, ought to involve societal judgments, involving the great religions and involving governments. Over and above that, scientists have an extra responsibility. They should tr try all they can to ensure that their work has benign applications and to try and avoid the uh, dangerous applications. We can't fall back on a model that involves making mistakes, learning from those mistakes and not making the same mistakes in future or making different mistakes because some of the mistakes we might potentially make will be of such consequence that we won't really be able to recover well from them or the costs will simply be too high. I'm very much an optimist and one of the things that's been really positive to me is just seeing how much people care about thinking in a long-term way about the future, seeing how much enthusiasm there is from research leaders to work together with people from the different backgrounds to think about how to beneficially guide technologies. It won't happen by default, which is why I think it's important that there be um, centres like ours thinking about these things ahead of time. <laughs>